This is Duke University. I'm Richard Nolan, the director of the Duke University Energy Initiative. I uh, want to welcome you to uh, actually the second uh, of our speakers in our new energy speaker series. It was a couple weeks ago we had uh, the airing of a film called Haynesville, uh, which was about some of the implications of a, a natural gas uh, discovery in Louisiana. Uh, and con continuing in our theme of uh, natural gas uh, this semester, uh, we're really uh, very lucky to have John Hanger with us today. Uh, John Hanger served as the secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection for over two years under former governor Edward Rendell. Um, he's also a former commissioner of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. And so that makes him one of two such individuals with both this very rich experience on the environmental protection side as well as the utility regulation side. Uh, John graduated from Duke University uh, with a BA in both policy studies and uh, history and has a JD from <coughs> the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Uh, in his capacity it, as both a public utility commissioner and head of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, John has written leading utility and environmental regulatory decisions, it enacted major environmental and utility rules, and played a pivotal role in passing major legislation. John was also in Pennsylvania in his role as head of the Department of Environmental Protection at the time when the Marcellus Shale was really taking off. And so he was really, we couldn't ha wish for somebody with a, a deeper experience in this area. Uh, John has a blog called uh, johnhanger. well, the, the address is johnhanger.blogs.com. Um, and it's John Hanger Facts of the Day, and that's actually a very uh, appropriate title for John's blog. In fact, one of the reasons why I thought John would be such a great person to come visit us with is the conversations that I've had with him, uh, both while he was actually in the role uh, in Pennsylvania, as well as afterward, uh, really was, spoke with true candor about the issues that are faced, I, you know, without a lot of spin, um, and I think John will do more for us today. In fact, the title, uh, he has a more, a little bit more toned down title here, but the title we had was Truth and Nothing But the Truth about Gas Drilling in America's Energy Choices. So uh, welcome, John Hanger. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I really always find uh, that the dialogue ex a part of a presentation is miles better than the monologue. So I, I am going to tr discipline myself to allow uh, time for, for dialogue. And my understanding is we're together until about 5.30, uh, and then we go our separate ways for a while. So I'm going to tear through a presentation uh, uh, that it will uh, not allow me to amplify some points that I normally would in more time. But the presentation is available to you, and I'd be glad to talk with you more in the future and offline and maybe even tomorrow. I'll be on campus tomorrow. So uh, without further ado, I, I want to just start by giving you a quick frame of reference. I don't think you can talk about shale gas, which is going to be the most of my remarks, without putting it in the context of energy choices. Uh, you, you can talk about shale gas without doing that. And in fact, most people do do that. But it's uh, frankly not a particularly uh, rich or thoughtful way of discussing shale gas. Uh, let me further say that there are multiple ways that we power society, and all of them aren't very good, uh, well, at least from an environmental perspective. I mean, they actually heat and light our homes pretty well. But from an environmental perspective, uh, and just focusing on that as the metric, uh, they, they aren't uh, very good. They, most of the criticisms that are made of uh, oil, coal, gas, uh, nuclear, solar, wind, at least when they're being <laughs> relatively honestly presented, are accurate. Uh, there, there, there are many uh, sound criticisms you can make of each and every one of the power choices or, or energy sources that uh, we, in fact, uh, use. The other thing that I think is remarkable about where we are uh, right now is that w we are at a point in time where we have at the s in the United States a, an incredible energy boom, not just a shale gas boom, but you know, uh, an energy boom. Uh, and uh, we also are at a point in time when we're finally taking energy efficiency and conservation and, and curbing demand seriously. 
So we are, we're booming in energy production, and we have an energy efficiency boom, too, which means uh, that our consumption uh, uh, has actually fallen in some rather remarkable ways. Uh, all of this is going on uh, right around us. So this is, a, this is a, a, a particularly rich time to talk about some of these things. Uh, gas production in 2011 set a record. Uh, U.S. gas production, I should be clear. Uh, you know, we've never, never produced more. In fact, the, the increase uh, was uh, about 7 to 8 percent last year over 2010, uh, you know, close to 5 uh, billion cubic feet per day more uh, of gas production. Uh, the U.S. oil production also it has broken a long slide and is heading back up, uh, uh, which is uh, thought to, uh, as recently as five years ago, thought to be just about impossible. Uh, that, uh, that, that trend line that was pretty well there uh, since uh, the 70s uh, was going to continue. Uh, it's not continuing. And it, it's not just a little blip going back up. I mean, there's a, it's a real beginning of a V, you know. Uh, so uh, th that's remarkable. Um, and that's affected uh, our, our, our imports. Uh, We've got some remarkable uh, changes in how much uh, oil we're importing, how much gasoline product uh, we're importing versus exporting. And refined products, we're actually a net exporter now, first time since 1949 the U.S. is a next ex net <coughs> exporter in refined products. Uh, we've had uh, near record production in nuclear, uh, despite uh, the challenges around Fukushima. Again, this is U.S. production. Uh, the one uh, energy source, big energy source, where we've seen actually uh, a modest decline um, is, is, in, is in coal production. And, and, it's, and it's more than a modest decline when you look at coal used in electricity. And, but for U.S. coal exports, you would have seen some more significant uh, U.S. coal production declines. Um, and, and the story isn't just fossil fuels or, or nuclear. Uh, renewable energy revolution is real. Uh, I'm a huge proponent, lay out my biases, I'm a huge proponent of renewable energy. Uh, I, I have spent a good part of my career uh, promoting wind, solar, and so forth. And I'm, nothing makes me happier, very frankly, than to travel by a wind farm, in Pen especially in Pennsylvania, where I'm particularly proud uh, of, uh, or to see solar arrays. And we've got 20 wind farms in Pennsylvania, and by the end of this year, we may have 1,500 megawatts of wind operating in Pennsylvania. I've got 125 megawatts of solar. Those numbers are actually extraordinary. Uh, from the perspective of 10 years ago, they would have been thought to be impossible. Uh, from the perspective of five years ago, wildly optimistic and still impossible in solar. Nobody thought uh, we would have 125 megawatts of solar in 2012, January 2012, February 2012, five years ago. Absolutely impossible. Uh, the re renewables are being driven by very impressive uh, uh, price declines plus public policy support. Uh, but uh, that's one of the other f uh, clear points uh, about where we are with renewables and with all of these energy choices. All of this activity is going on in a marketplace that's riddled with various kinds of subsidies. Uh, and then th the single biggest subsidy is the failure to include certain externalities in the price of energy. That's the single biggest subsidy. Probably the second biggest subsidy globally is uh, fossil fuel end-user consumer subsidies, you know, $500 billion a year the world's governments uh, uh, give to their consumers in the form of low-priced oil and, and gasoline because they would have unrest, as they just had in Nigeria. They've had riots in Nigeria when they try to end some of the fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, the Chinese government's very careful <laughs> about where they, uh, how, how much they wean uh, uh, those subsidies in China because of social uh, issues. So this boom is going on in, in the context of that marketplace. Uh, I, I think uh, we should also focus on the energy efficiency boom. And part of that's been driven by high-priced oil. Uh, and, and some of the decline in, in oil consumption is because we have actually moved to some substitutes like, like biofuels. I mean, the, the, the biofuel production in the U.S. is significant now. I mean, it really matters. Uh, uh, but some of it is simply going on because people have decided that they're going to actually buy that Prius. Uh, you know, there's a one million Priuses on the road in the U.S. Uh, and three million uh, in the world. And that's all happened very quickly. Uh, and that's just 
sort of the most dramatic example of a move uh, driven largely by price uh, towards more energy efficient cars. And now we also have some policy initiatives around the world. I mean, the Chinese government has put in place pretty impressive fuel standards for vehicles. Uh, many countries in the world have. The U.S. now is actually catching up uh, with uh, the, those standards. So there's a big, big boom going on in energy efficiency. So, you know, to just go back one thing, look at that. Oil consumption uh, peaked, uh, oil consumption right now is roughly at May 1999 levels. Uh, and gasoline consumption is at September 2011 levels. And no, it's not just because the economy just about went into a depression <laughs> in 2008 following the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. You know, we've had GDP growth in this country now since July 1st, 2009. You know, we've had every quarter has been GDP growth. We're, you know, we're actually clawing the U.S. economy back to uh, pretty close to where we were prior to the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy. So that's not a, simply a function of uh, very significant uh, economic problems uh, in end of 2008 and into the first half of 2009. It's some structural changes and I think some behavioral changes that are going on. Power generation trends, uh, how are we getting our electricity. So now we're into the electric sector, we're moving away from the transportation sector, and uh, there's just big changes going on. Uh, uh, you might not think, or lo everybody looking at that chart might not think there's, those are any big changes there. But for the U.S. energy system, where you know, the electric uh, capacity in the U.S. is over a million megawatts, a uh, uh, thousand gigawatts, uh, these kind of percentage changes are almost like a battleship turning in the course of one year. I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but I mean, they're big, big changes. You know, wind going from zero to 2.3 percent, uh, and that was in 2010, you know, 2011 number would be even a little higher, uh, is extraordinary uh, in that period of time. We've got close to 50,000 megawatts of wind capacity built in the U.S. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, uh, solar is actually on the scoreboard now. and. Uh, in the fourth quarter of uh, 2011, close to 1,000 megawatts of solar were built in the U.S. I mean, that's a crazy good number from where I sit. You know, there are those who don't like those, uh, those energy sources for a variety of reasons, and we can talk about them, and maybe there's some of you in this room who don't like those energy sources, and we can talk about it. But from where I stand, that's a crazy good development. Um, but the coal and gas is really the heart of it. Uh, Look, look what's started to happen. And that 2010 number is uh, out of date. You know, 2011, it looks like it was about 42 and a half percent. So these, these things are moving, these numbers are moving quickly. Uh, and they're going to be down in you know, 41 percent, certainly 2012, 2013. Now, the question I have is when does gas and coal cross? And it's not if in my mind, in the U.S. Wh when, when does gas provide more electricity in the U.S. than, than coal? Uh, you notice nuclear is pretty stable. That's pretty interesting because there hasn't been any, well, hardly any new build, but what's happened at many of these uh, nuclear plants is uh, repowering or adding uh, a, a more efficient generation, getting more power out of existing uh, plants. So some, some of these plants built in the 70s and 80s uh, have had major capital investments so that they can actually generate more electricity. Um, I think I've already hit most of these. I, I do want to just pause on the solar power prices uh, because I'm a proponent of the public policy that has said solar is a strategic industry in the U.S. That's a point of contention in the U.S. It's not a point of contention in China and some other parts of the world. <laughs> Uh, there's a, there's a, their, their, their societies and their governments are focused on uh, capturing solar. Uh, but here in the U.S. it's very much a point of contention. And I would suggest what's happened in solar it shows that our public policies have been working. Uh, why? It's not so much that we've built 1,000 megawatts in the fourth <laughs> quarter. It's the price drops. Uh, and it's not simply our public policies. Obviously, the fact that the world has decided to target solar and China right at the top of the list, but it's not just China, it's Germany and uh, some European countries that have targeted it, uh, have produced extraordinary price drops. Uh, th those numbers are startling, uh, and uh, they absolutely, in my mind, represent something that will be as big as shale. Uh, I was the only person saying that uh, publicly, 
But I, now the David Crane, who's the CEO of NRG, is saying that. Uh, so I've got some company in the, in the uh, for-profit big energy world uh, actually saying such a thing. Uh, within a few years, solar in the U.S. is going to be big as shale. Um, so shale, whoops. Our, our objective in Pennsylvania, and let me just tell you, I was the, the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection from 2008 uh, to uh, January 2011. And that was the period when uh, gas drilling, or, uh, I shouldn't say gas drilling, I should say shale drilling uh, began, really took off in Pennsylvania. Um, and Pennsylvania's had gas drilling for decades and decades and decades. In fact, the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania right before the U.S. Civil War in 1857. Uh, and we've drilled over 350,000 oil and gas wells in, in Pennsylvania, many of which are, are, are sort of lost to, to history or lost until perhaps you stumble across them. There have been a lot of orphan uh, wells. And it is a reminder about the, fa the failures of regulation or for a lot of that history, the absence of regulation and what happens when, quote unquote, the invisible hand is left to itself. You get a lot of abandoned gas wells not properly plugged. Uh, that's what Pennsylvania's history shows. So our, our objective when the, the, the shale uh, revolution came was two things strategically, produce the gas and protect the environment. And we don't think it's the case that there's total tension between those two things. In fact, producing gas can help protect the environment, though there is some conflict and some tension. So how have we been doing on producing the gas? Well, I think by any standard, there's a lot of gas being produced uh, in the Marcellus, most of which is in Pennsylvania, but it does include uh, some ongoing production in West Virginia, a little bit of production in Ohio, uh, no, no real Marcellus production in New York yet. These, these are big numbers, uh, 4,000 wells drilled, uh, that, that per cubic feet per day is significant, uh, uh, 1.2 trillion cubic feet, uh, it's roughly 6% of uh, U.S. Total, total gas production. And Pennsylvania was uh, uh, about a sixth of that total before, so if we were 1%, uh, that was probably actually stretching things uh, prior to the, the shale gas uh, production. Um, and most likely, it's going to expand from here. Now, uh, all this production has crashed the price. <laughs> and uh, m markets move quickly. Uh, even markets with all kinds of imperfections uh, move quickly. And uh, this market has been moving quickly. Uh, the, some of the producers have uh, started to uh, reduce gas drilling, especially for so-called dry gas, where there are no liquids uh, as a second uh, or is it these days now a main revenue source for supporting the capital investment in the, in the gas drilling uh, rig? I mean, a typical gas, shale gas well in Pennsylvania is somewhere between four and $10 million of capital investment. Uh, it's a big financial decision just to do you know, one. Uh, so a price that goes from uh, $6, or, well, put it this way. July of 2008, ga gas prices were $13 for 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, today, they're roughly 250. Uh, the, the pain point, which clearly caused the, uh, a reduction in gas drilling, seems to be below $3, <laughs> uh, maybe below $4. So people were obviously thinking about their capital investment decisions when it went below 4 but when it got below 3 they started acting. Uh, so the, the, the pain point seems to be around 4 and the decision point is clearly 3 New York, we can talk about New York. New York has not done uh, shale gas drilling uh, in 2012. They have actually had uh, gas drilling in New York, and they've had fracking in New York. And this might surprise some people, in, but they've been fracking uh, in New York uh, for a long time. Uh, quote unquote, fracking is not anything new. This wasn't new in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we can uh, come back to that. But uh, Governor Cuomo seems uh, inclined to begin uh, full shale gas drilling, though he has ruled out uh, a couple of areas, significant areas. N New York City and Syracuse watersheds are off limits. New York City and Syracuse do not filter their water. Uh, there's no such water supply in Pennsylvania. Everything in Pennsylvania is filtered and, and fully treated, but in New York, 
that's not the case. And so there's, they're particularly sensitive and careful about uh, the watersheds that supply drinking water to New York City and Syracuse. Now, let's quickly talk about some of the environmental issues. And I, I want to start by saying that they're real. You cannot do any gas drilling, let alone shale gas development, without impacting the environment to some extent. Uh, that, that, and I will take you through very quickly uh, some of them and, and, and develop a few of the really important ones a little more. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the major concerns has been around water. Uh, and two, fault, two parts of it, withdrawing the water, because each shale gas uh, well requires a, a fairly significant amount of water. Where is the water going to come from? Uh, and what's the impact on uh, its sources? And then disposing of the water. Uh, the, the, that comes back uh, as part of the production process, production water, flowback water. The water that comes back, uh, especially from shale wells, is, is heavily, heavily polluted. It's, it's nasty stuff. And, uh, it it uh, certainly needs to be properly uh, dealt with. Um, operational problems, accidents. Now, frankly, in Texas and Oklahoma, the kind of things that draw front-page attention in Pennsylvania uh, probably don't even make the local newspaper. Uh, but in, in Pennsylvania, even though we've had gas drilling for a long time, it's been a small industry up until 2008. And truthfully, it was out of sight and out of mind. It was out of sight and out of mind of our populations. It was out of sight and out of mind out of state government. And it was out of sight and out of mind uh, uh, for the environmental community. Uh, as I said, we've been fracking in Pennsylvania a long time. I didn't hear about fracking <laughs> until uh, essentially 2008. Uh, but there have been significant spills and leaks by this industry. We have over 80 companies in Pennsylvania, and they're not all A students. Uh, in fact, if you're applying a bell curve to the class, uh, you got more C's and B minus operators than you got A or F students, but you got some of both. Uh, and uh, these operational problems and leaks have caused some direct envi environmental uh, problems. There's been a few small fish kills, for example. Uh, there have been some uh, s uh, small number of private water wells that have been contaminated as a result of this. Uh, and there have been some fatalities of workers at, at uh, the sites. No, no, nobody who hasn't been employed in the industry has been killed or injured, but there have been fatalities as a result of that. Truck traffic is another major uh, environmental impact. Uh, there's a lot of trucks on the road. This is major industrial activity. This is big time industrial activity. And part of it is significant truck traffic uh, so that you get issues of congestion, road damage. When, when I'm talking about road damage, I'm not talking about a pothole. I'm talking about the roads destroyed uh, because of trucks uh, that are too heavy and literally chew up the road, turning it into mud. In a few cases, it's made roads un impassable to ambulances and other, other, other uh, emergency responders for a few days at a time. Significant impact. And then unsafe trucks. When I was secretary, I formed an, uh, an agreement with the Pennsylvania State Police to do random stops of drilling trucks. And uh, about 40% of the trucks stopped in this industry were put out of service by the state police because they were unsafe. Uh, that's uh, a, obviously a significant uh, sign of, of a problem, uh, a problem that was addressed and is being addressed very aggressively, uh, at least in Pennsylvania. Uh, gas migration. This is, a, this is a, a, a real issue, though some in the gas industry uh, deny it to this day. Some will say there has been no uh, case of gas migrating from a poorly constructed gas well to s contaminate anybody's water supply. And I'm distinguishing that from frac fluids returning from depth. We can talk about that. We're, that's a separate uh, issue. But gas migration uh, has been confirmed uh, well before we had fracking uh, or well before we had shale wells in, in Pennsylvania. We, we've had some poor gas drilling cause gas to migrate to people's property uh, well before 2008, 2005. And we've had some since then. Uh, the most famous example of this and the one that's in the news 
right now is in a place called Dimmock, Pennsylvania, which we can talk a little bit about. And there's been some studies by uh, Professor Jackson here uh, at Duke University uh, and, and others uh, around, around this issue. Uh, Penn State University has also done a study. So there's a, there's a variety of academic studies to, to look at there. Public lands and state forests and parks. Most Pennsylvanians view gas drilling on somebody's private property as different from gas drilling on a public land, a state forest or state park. I do, I lay out my biases. Um, I'm opposed to gas drilling on parks, and I, I support the moratorium that Governor Rendell put in place on further drilling on state forests. We've, ha we've drilled oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania state forests for decades. Uh, but the professional staff uh, at the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources has said that further drilling uh, would now, in fact, mean the sustainability rating uh, of the state forest would be lost. And the timber industry, uh, which timbers in the state forest, actually needs that sustainability rating in order to, pr to pr preserve their jobs. Um, Taxation is a big, big issue, almost unique to Pennsylvania. We don't tax it, which is, again, my bias. Uh, I think it's crazy. Uh, it's a, we have no uh, severance tax. We have no property tax. We may now today have a fee, optional, assessed by a county, uh, uh, county by county basis, uh, that even if the county does it, would work out to be the lowest uh, total payment in the country. Uh, and the Marcellus and the Pennsylvania resource is about the close to, to the best <laughs> in the country. So if anybody should tax it, it should be Pennsylvania, and we're not. Uh, staffing of oil and gas programs. Uh, many states say the Fed should stay out of the way, let the, let the, let the uh, states uh, regulate. That's an interesting conversation. I, have, I actually have a certain amount of sympathy for that with one very important caveat. I noticed how well the Feds did in the Gulf. Uh, and, I mean, they literally allowed the oil and gas industry to capture the former mineral management uh, services, and they put, uh, that, that, that agency wasn't protecting the environment in the Gulf. They were just uh, engaged in literally corrupt practices, literally corrupt practices, uh, with certain companies that were also engaged in literally corrupting federal employees. Uh, so I'm not one of these people who think that the federal government is going to protect Pennsylvania's environment or any state's environment automatically better than that state. But I also have a certain amount of, uh, let's call it healthy skepticism about state government. I've been in it twice and out of it quite a lot. And one of the key tests, I think, is do you have enough staff? If you're going to, if you're going to insist on state regulation, do you have enough staff to do that? And the public is on to this. Uh, uh, and this issue of staffing doesn't get enough discussion, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. I actually believe that the, the uh, air impacts associated with gas drilling are a more significant challenge than the water impacts. If I were to rank the, the damage done to Pennsylvania's water, uh, gas drilling would probably not make the top 10 list. Uh, that's not, and I, I want to quickly say, I'm not saying there's no impact. There is some impact on, on private water supplies. Nobody who has had a public water system uh, pays a water bill uh, for water service has had any impact from gas drilling in Pennsylvania. Uh, they do get impacts from bacteria and loading of the rivers with uh, raw human sewage, uh, which we do all the time in Pennsylvania, acid mine drainage. I can go on and on and on. Uh, there are many significant impacts to water in Pennsylvania but gas drilling doesn't make the top 10 list, probably. Uh, now, for the 150 or 100 to 150 families who've had their water contaminated with methane, that's a disaster to that family. That family has probably had their property uh, essentially uh, reduced to zero value. Uh, who would buy if a home where the water has unsafe levels of methane, and that's your only source of water? Uh, but air impacts, cumulatively, could be substantial. Now I'm talking about all of the emissions from the engines associated with all the different process, parts of the gas production process, the gas drilling, the fracking itself, uh, as well as the uh, moving of the gas from a, a, a gas well to, to uh, a point of uh, consumption. Should be much more attention to that issue, in my view. 
Number nine, and I'm going to come back to this, to the public there is no clear benefit uh, between natural gas production and the environment. No public health benefit. The public's wrong about that. Very, very, very wrong about that. And we'll talk some more about that. But in the, in the public mind, th they view environmentally and as a matter of public health, gas as simply a negative. No positive. And, and we'll get back to why that they're wrong about that and it has everything to do with our choices and, and what we are doing if, when we don't use gas. Disclosure of chemicals is a big public issue. It's something that a lot of folks have focused on. I think at the end of the day, truthfully, it, it won't make much difference to the environment one way or the other, but it's an enormous trust issue and the gas industry has totally, totally flubbed this issue. Uh, and then the credibility of regulation and regulators. I'm a firm believer that markets work well with good rules and actually regulators that enforce good rules. And often we've had in recent history and throughout our history examples where regulators don't do that. Uh, in some cases they are put in place not to do that. <laughs> in some cases, quote unquote, you have deregulation. Uh, and depending on the terms of deregulation, I've either been a proponent or an opponent. I've been actually a supporter of ending electricity generation monopolies at retail and at wholesale. I believe in competition in building power plants. I think it's great that a solar developer can connect to the grid without begging to the local electric utility. That's not true everywhere, by the way. <laughs> Still, quite a few solar developers have to beg to their local electric utility to connect to the grid. That's not true in Pennsylvania. You or anybody else can build a wind farm and connect to the grid. Uh, and the choice, again, is between that kind of model or having five politically appointed regulators in Harrisburg govern all of that. Over, the, over time, I've come to the conclusion uh, that Winston Churchill said about democracy, it's the worst damn system until you think of every other alternative. Uh, and then you arrive at that, well, okay. <laughs> Despite all the problems with it, it's better than living in Tehran today. Um, so what, 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 what is, what is uh, the, the, the response to all of this? At least in Pennsylvania, very quickly, we massively rewrote all our rules starting in 2008 on uh, water withdrawal, water disposal, new uh, standards for the design and construction of gas wells, uh, as well as uh, a broad uh, bu buffer requirement for, from all development for uh, our high quality streams, which are 22,000 miles, a quarter of all of our streams. So we try to get the words right on paper. And I don't have time to go through all of this, so I'm going to skip the content of the rules. It's in the presentation uh, to get to the, to, uh, the uh, next point, staffing. We also took this seriously. When I walked through the doors, we had 88 people in the department's uh, oil and gas program. The Department of Environmental Protection is also the energy office and it also regulates the gas industry. We had 88 people there. When we left, uh, in January 2011, we are 202. To my knowledge, Pennsylvania is the only state who has taken this part of the responsibility for oversight seriously. I think we're the only state that has anything approaching that kind of hiring record. I know New York is looking at this carefully. But it's not enough to have the rules right and enough of the environmental cops on the beat. They've actually got to have the political leadership to go and enforce the rules. And they've got to be told not, not to turn their back or avert their gaze, and certainly in Pennsylvania, 1,200 violations, that's a lot of violations. And I'll give the ga gas industry some credit here. Uh, they appealed very, very few of these, probably less than 10. And that's very different from some parts of the coal industry, not all, there's some coal companies that are very safe and take violations seriously, but there was a very famous company that no longer exists, thank goodness, called Massey Energy, that more or less routinely appealed a coal mining safety violation, to put it into a legal system that would churn on uh, like a, some kind of like Bleak House and Dickens, you know, Dick Charles Dickens, just churning, churning, churning a legal process to stop any real uh, impact on their operations. That's not what the gas industry, at least in Pennsylvania, has been doing. Generally, they've uh, corrected the violations, paid the fines, paid the cleanup costs, and, and so forth. Water withdrawal. I have to just spend a moment on this because it gets to the public concern. I, at the beginning, and even to this day, I often hear how horrible all these water withdrawals are. Maybe in Texas, where they've got a drought caused by climate change, it is, in fact, a big problem. In Pennsylvania, we've got lots of water, and you can see 
the amount of withdrawals for gas drilling is tiny compared to the total withdrawals each day. 1.9 million gallons uh, are withdrawn uh, e each day in Pennsylvania uh, for gas drilling out of 9.48 billion. It's less than half of 1%. And that, that's with the draws. The, the flow in the river is even bigger than the 9.48 billion. You know, the flow is orders of magnitude higher than that. The, the most important environmental issues that are air emissions, the, the smog issue, the, the EPA proposed rule is huge. Uh, this is very critical. Uh, the methane leakage issue, uh, which is also important and is uh, significantly addressed by the EPA proposed rule. Uh, the Cornell study that uh, Professor Howarth uh, issued in uh, spring of 2010 ha has been debunked by now six studies, including another research team at Cornell. I just highlight three, the National Energy Technology Lab, Carnegie Mellon University study that was funded by the Sierra Club, the World Watch Institute, which is an environmental nonprofit, all of which have concluded that burning coal on a life cycle basis emits twice as much carbon as, as a natural gas power plant does, two times more. There's one study that says uh, uh, gas is dirtier than coal on carbon, uh, and there are a long laundry list uh, of studies uh, c contradicting that. There's the gas migration issue. That's a ser serious, significant issue for the families impacted. Uh, I continue and will always say that. I will also then go on to say, in the big picture, the, the, uh, the number of, of families that have been impacted by, uh, have lost their water as a result of this problem or of gas drilling is small compared to the daily insults that are going on from other sources. Now, that's not a reason to allow it, and it's certainly not a reason to, to insist on or to, to, to avoid compensation to those families. Uh, but it is important to keep this in, in perspective. I don't have time right now, maybe in questions and answers, we can get to these two very current and famous cases. They're quite different. Wyoming is not even a shale gas uh, uh, development. It's a shallow gas uh, development. Dimmick is a shale gas development. That's just one of the differences, but we can go on from there. Um, now to wrap this up, in terms of our energy choices, all right, so you want to say no to gas. And typically when I talk on campuses, I ask how many people of you want to ban gas, don't want to use gas? A lot of hands go up. I also then ask how many of you use gas? A few hands stay up. <laughs> I think less than in fact there are. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, 51% of American homes run on natural gas during the winter. So a lot of Americans are getting through the winter by, by gas. But if you, if you do want to do that, you have to come to grips with what's going to take its place. And you know, in the U.S., we get roughly 55 to 60% of our total energy from coal and oil. You know, uh, 80% roughly speaking from coal, oil, and gas. And, you know, 20 percent, roughly speaking, from nuclear and renewables. And by the way, the renewables, most of the renewable piece is coming from large hydro and corn ethanol, which a lot of environmentalists have huge problems with. Most of the renewables is not coming from solar and wind, as much as I would like it to be. Uh, the answer is, if you're going to say no to gas, the tremendous changes that we're seeing in the number of coal-fired power plants and their production runs wouldn't be happening right now. They would be running full, and we'd be building more. In fact, we were having a coal, new coal rush on the drawing boards as recently as 2005. We did ban gas once in, with the, the federal government, actually banned using gas for power production in 1978. And the country went on a coal a power plant building tear in the next 10 years. Uh, and those coal plants are operating today, churning out huge amounts of carbon uh, often uh, lead, mercury, soot. Uh, at the end of the day, look at that one number. EPA states, and this is just one, one of the regulations that the President Obama and, and uh, Administrator Jackson are moving, the air toxic rule, save up to 34,000 lives per year. Now, why are 34,000 people dying prematurely each year, according to the EPA? because they're building, breathing pollution coming from coal-burning power plants, not natural gas power plants. The natural gas power plants actually comply 
with that rule because burning natural gas doesn't put all of this stuff that sickens and kills people into the air. Now, if gas was killing 34,000 people per year and coal was not, I would be here talking about the virtues of coal. But that's not the facts. That's just not the facts. And you, people have to come to grips with that if they are going to avoid uh, or support their, their view that natural gas should be shut down. I would love to be able to tell you that you could immediately jump to solar and wind right now. I would love that to be a truthful answer. Uh, it's absolutely not a truthful answer today. Uh, I'm absolutely in agreement with those who want to move uh, those technologies forward, and I'm, again, really happy by what has happened uh, as a result of the tremendous advances uh, in the industries themselves and in public policy with both. It's promising, uh, and it's, it's indeed hopeful. But for the next 10 years, if you're sal saying no to gas, uh, you are saying yes to coal and oil in the U.S. and even more so around the world. Last points, I don't have time to go through all of the, the economics. We can talk about it. But I think it's critically important to understand these two points. And I want to put this in, in the context of uh, a poor person. Uh, I started my work in Philadelphia at Community Legal Services out of law school, representing poor people who couldn't pay their heating bills. I, I represented people who had their gas shut off, uh, the electricity shut off, who brought in candles, uh, brought in uh, kerosene heaters and other dangerous uh, substitutes, and in, s in some cases had fires in which uh, uh, children and others were, were died. I, I had a client who lost children in, in such a fire. The decline in gas prices alone has meant roughly a 50 percent decline in the heating bills of people in the city of Philadelphia, everyone, rich and poor. For, for the rich or the middle class, it's a good thing. For the poor, it's a lifesaver. Uh, and th for those who, are, again, are going to insist that now we should shut down this industry, they need to also come to grips with what it means uh, for poor people and for our economy. Thank you. So John's going to take one. questions and he's going to handle it himself. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll go for uh, about, 20, we have about 20, 20 minutes yeah. of questions. Uh, I went a few minutes longer than I should have. But anyway. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I grew up in Pittsburgh. And yeah. it's hard for me to go home for more than 24 hours without someone wanting to talk about uh, shale gas. Well, the, the most important thing they could do is operate safely. <laughs> this isn't all spin and communications. Uh, it's like Walter Mondale said of Gary Hart in 1984 when he was challenged, where's the beef? So my first response to the gas industry is, where's the safety beef? You know, there are some companies that take safety very, very, very seriously. And there's a difference between excellence and perfection. You know, I get on a plane and I expect to get off even though I know there's a chance that they're not perfect and they might not. Uh, there are going to be accidents even by, by excellent companies. But this industry as a whole isn't operating excellently. So the first thing they can do is operate excellently and cut down the number of incidents and reduce the risks. The risks will never go to zero. You've got to also be honest about that with people. They don't go to zero. Uh, in terms of, of how you communicate, uh, you know, the next thing I would say is when you make a mistake, fix it and own up to it. Don't lawyer up. Don't run to the PR people and, and fight every single claim that you made a mistake, almost like it's, the, it's Armageddon. Now, now, I mentioned the violations. 
when often they are, have responded well. But there are some of these cases that even if they were right, it's just stupid uh, in terms of a, a, their policy. I think what's going on in Demick, for example, is wrong. Uh, it's morally wrong. I think it's also insane from a business standpoint. Uh, so those are the two things I would offer to them. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think the production of gas is going uh, to, or should you say the, the use of natural gas for producing electricity is going to catch up with the supply and prices are going to rise, or is production going to keep on accelerating? And yeah, I, I, in the well, it's, I think it's a pretty easy question to answer in one respect and then an impossible question to answer in another respect. Will prices stay where they are today? Essentially 250. No. Uh, I think I'm on very st strong ground <laughs> in saying that. I, I think it's got to go up from there. I, I, I cannot believe that it's going to consistently uh, clear much below $4. I think that's the floor of a sort of a sustainable market. And you know, somewhere, I think it's somewhere between 4 and 6. And then demand has a lot to do with this. Right. Uh, and so far, most of the growth in demand has been in, in electricity. We are literally moving from coal to gas. And from an environmental standpoint, that is an enormous thing. The benefits, the lives that are being saved by that are enormous. And again, people have to come to grips with that. Uh, uh, so uh, somewhere between four and six going forward, but the four and six part, I'm less confident about than I am saying it goes from 250 to 4. Okay. Yes, sir. So we have, of course, there's discussion about doing fracking in the center base in South Bay, North Carolina. And I've met some of those homeowners. And um, it, it seems like to them, uh, they think they're going to let a lot of the oil companies on do their fracking and retire millionaires. So is this realistic? Are these homeowners, are, are right. millionaires being made in Pennsylvania? Yeah, there are millionaires being made in Pennsylvania. Not everyone who has signed a lease has become a millionaire. And very frankly, there were some pretty uh, unjust leases signed early on in this process. Uh, you know, $25 an acre, very low royalty payments that are legally enforceable leases. Shame on companies for who chose to go that way. Uh, but yeah, there's real wealth being created. and, and Farmers who were losing their farms are, st are now staying on the land. Uh, and I can tell you, gas drilling, while it's taking place in the fracking process, the first year of development, it's ugly. It's, it's big time in industrial practice. Uh, and there are emissions. It's ugly. But once that is all done, I've seen a lot, lot worse. You know, a lot of the land is restored. And you know, over longer periods of time, it takes a pretty trained eye, in some cases, to know that there's even a gas well producing at a site. I mean, it really does. Uh, it's, not, it's not a big intrusion at, at that point. But you better be ready, if you sign a lease, to have a year, at least, of major impact. And there are risks. I mean, some families have had their water contaminated with methane. Yes, ma'am. And then we'll go to the gentleman behind you. In the long haul, the small percentage of water being used now, but as the growth of the gas extraction goes up, the use of the water will go up. And to what extent is the water, since apparently drilling is at a much deeper level than the aquifers, lost? Yeah. Look, and, it, it, you know, and, and I think it really does matter how much water you have. And in Pennsylvania, we're water rich. Our, our problems in, in, in Pennsylvania is not too little water. It's too much water in the wrong places. My hometown was flooded, and somebody died in a flood in 2011. Okay, That was our water problem in 2011. Um, I don't mean to be you know, cavalier about the response, but in Pennsylvania, it's just not a problem, the amount of water. Uh, we did put in a water uh, withdrawal rule because when the invisible hand was left to itself, uh, there were two very small streams in the summer of 2008 where a company did put an equivalent of a big straw in a s small glass and caused some damage. So now in Pennsylvania, they have to file a water plan at the time they apply for a drilling permit. The water plan has to state uh, how much water is going to be withdrawn, uh, where it's going. 
Uh, it's only approved if the uh, water withdrawal would not damage the stream were it in a drought condition. So the assumption is the stream is in a drought state, and only then is it allowed. So in terms of uh, the other thing that's happened in Pennsylvania, and again, there's so much to talk about. We literally could talk for days, uh, weeks. Uh, the, a lot of, of the water now, the flow back water, uh, is actually uh, recycled or reused. So the industry uh, was told in Pennsylvania in 2009 uh, by our administration that we were no longer going to allow them to discharge drilling wastewater to rivers and streams untreated for totally dissolved solids. And uh, there's a long story there. And, and my successor actually has done a very good job on this element. I have some disagreements with him. But this element, he's actually enforced that rule in a way that has stopped that, that from, I will say, largely and perhaps completely happening. And we had been allowing that to go on in Pennsylvania for decades and decades. And it was a, not a good thing when it was allowed to go on. So you know, in Pennsylvania, the, the drilling wastewater now is often reused and, and, and uh, re so-called recycled and taken to the next well. Even, uh, even, and that's actually a lower cost option often than trucking new fresh water in. So it's both environmentally good and it's uh, also uh, economically good. It's an example where green is uh, uh, both good for the environment and good for the economy. Uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, at least, water sourcing is not a big problem as long as you have, I think it's been proven you need some regulatory scheme uh, and you need some minimal uh, common sense by the operators. Now, you know, in Texas and some other parts where your water's scarce, uh, that's, I think, trickier. This, this woman here, yeah, sorry. Uh, since gas is uh, really cheap, relatively cheap now, um, so for some gas companies now, there is a strategy to export uh, natural gas to some countries with a shortage of energy resources like Japan. So. What do you perceive this strategy? What kind of problems? Yeah. Well, gas, uh, it, it's another example of how the world's turned completely around or on its head within five years. We were going to be supposedly natural gas short. And we were building and did build LNG import facilities. Most of those LNG fi import facilities have been a real loser for their investors. I mean, talk about risks in, in capitalism. Well, there's one where people got burnt. Uh, they built LNG import facilities, and we are not in the business, really. Uh, we still do actually import a little LNG, but generally speaking, that's not, doesn't look like a good business to be in. Uh, export, so at least one of those facilities is now re-engineering and investing in more billions to, so they can export. And there are permits being applied for by various companies to export. And they are responding to the fact that we have this huge amount of gas at a very low price here, whereas in Asia, the price can be $12 to $16 for 1,000 cubic feet, while we're at $250, you know, at the Henry Hub. Uh, Europe, $10 each still. A lot of uh, gas is priced around the world in relationship to oil. Uh, that's not what happens in the U.S. I mean, there's been a complete total break between the oil and gas prices in the U.S., but that's not actually the case around the world, generally speaking. So um, what does that mean? Well, look, for our balance of trade, any export is good. Uh, for the companies that have the gas that will marginally increase the price, probably, that's good. For manufacturers who are coming to, to US of, or expanding the US because of low price gas, they don't like it. And there's going to be this tug of war between producers and consumers uh, of, of gas. Uh, we do already export <coughs> some gas. I mean, we have pipelines carrying gas north and south. Uh, so it's, it's not the, the case that we've never exported gas. We both import a little bit of gas and export a little bit of gas. So I think that's something to watch. Uh, it's probably, probably an issue where some kind of reasonable middle with, with, with uh, adjustments as you go along probably makes some sense. And frankly, at 250, there's a good case uh, the, that gas is, it's too much of a good thing. Uh, the price is too low. Uh, it's hard to say that to any consumer, right? You always want, <laughs> can't be low enough. But, but you know, from a social point of view, economic point, point of view, 
this, the case is getting stronger that this is too low. Yeah, sorry. When comparing the uh, state and federal regulations, um, what concern do you have that potentially in women's states it could be a race to the bottom? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's always a concern, and uh, you know the strength in federalism it allows I guess it was Brandeis to talk about each state being a democracy or a laboratory for democracy, but there's a risk, and uh, one of them is uh, a race to the bottom. At least from where I, I stand, that's a risk, uh, and I think some level you're seeing that in the Pennsylvania quote unquote tax debate. We're, we're in the process of establishing a fee that will be the lowest in the country, when we've probably got one of the richest resources in the country. So uh, does that counsel for some federal floors? You know, possibly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, of a view that state governments generally are closer to the people than the President of the United States is. And it's easier to impact a government in a state legislature than it is the U.S. Senate. And generally, I, th I view that that means that state regulation can uh, work, but it doesn't always. So uh, I think the states, if they want to keep the federal government out of this, have a responsibility, at least on the environmental side, to make sure that they're regulating seriously and appropriately. Oh, yes, sir, you've been patient. I just was going to ask if you could give us an update on the uh, Oil and Gas Act and the proposed strengthening of back in June or July, and just to know your Yeah, they, they passed, the, passed the Senate, State Senate, yesterday, and uh, at least some, some provisions. And it's, it may have passed uh, the House as I was traveling. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are provisions in there about increased setbacks and a variety of other mechanisms. There's also a very controversial provision in there in limiting uh, local regulation uh, of the uh, gas industry. Uh, I frankly haven't re reviewed the final bill because really it's just come out of a, a pretty close group of folks about 24 hours ago, so I'm not even sure many people have really read it. Uh, but I think it's probably going to be on Governor Corbett's desk in, in a day or so. Yes. What uh, effect do you think grid parity with uh, solar PV will have on natural gas? <coughs> natural gas on grid parity. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is the other, the other, the other point. Uh, you can't talk seriously about large-scale renewable build-out without gas, and uh, simply from an operational standpoint. Uh, I, I look at California's energy mix where they're moving aggressively to both renewables and gas. I mean, California is going to be roughly 55% natural gas and 30% renewables. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that's the kind of energy mix that's doable in a short period of time. You know, compared to our current energy mix on the power sector, <laughs> in terms of just the environmental impacts, there's no comparison. Now, Pennsylvania, the country still has got to get 41, 42 percent of its electricity from burning coal, and roughly a third of the power plants are more than 40 years old. Now, many of those power plants have been already pushed out of dispatch for most of the hours of the day by the low price of natural gas, so they're not operating very much each year. But they still operate, and a uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old power plant, uh, one company, First Energy, announced closing an 80 year old coal burning power plant in Indianapolis just this week, or last week, last week, 80 year old. And you, 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 so if you're moving away from that kind of uh, power production to, to <coughs> natural gas it's, and, and renewables, you're, you're just on the environmental basis, absolutely uh, making big strides forward. The last thing that should be mentioned about coal is that the price has been going up. It's one of the under commented upon or reported stories. I mean, for the last 10 years, it's been going up <coughs> 6 to 7% each and every year. Now, it looks like now, at least in the US, we'll probably have some 
stability in coal prices in the next couple of years or so. But for the la literally the last 10 years, you've seen an almost a doubling of, of coal prices. So this hasn't, it hasn't always been cheap, even when, when the health costs are not included. So if, is it, if there's one last question, we'll take one last question, <coughs> and then we're going to have a reception afterward. And so I'm sure uh, uh, we'll be willing yeah. to take additional questions there. So. Uh, you had a line on vehicle consumption for combustion engines. Um, so how would it compare if I have an electrical car and I make my electricity a gas fire power plant versus burning natural gas in the engine directly? Uh, right. Uh, well, um, in the, you know, I'm not. I, I just looked at the AC Triple E rankings of the greenest cars. They just came out with their 14th uh, ranking. Uh, it's greencars.org, uh, and uh, the the greenest car for eight years in a row was a Honda Civic gas car for eight years in a row until this year. It's now number two. Uh, the, there was a it's uh, this year a Mitsubishi product, an electric battery product, was ranked by by at least that index as being quote unquote greener. Uh, so uh, generally, the, the uh, you know, internal combustion engines are not very efficient. I mean, they, they, they have a lot of waste heat. And uh, so generally, a very efficient gas-fired power plant, especially if you're doing co-generation, you're, you're going to get very significant energy advantages and, and environmental advantages. Uh, it's one of the reasons why an electric vehicle, even on a grid with 40 percent uh, coal, or 41 percent coal, 42 percent coal, is less polluting than you know, many gasoline-fired engines. Right. Mm. So we can talk some more. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.